It seems this season of the year begins sooner and sooner with each year that goes by. It used to be the day after Thanksgiving. And then it began, uh, it began the day of Thanksgiving. And somewhere it morphed its way into early November and then October, and it seems almost October 1st. You see the stores starting putting out the green things and the red things without the music and enticing you into the stores to get ready for this season. I don't like that, but yet, I do like that. It's a bit of a conundrum on one hand. Because the season is so special and sacred, and there's a sense of anticipation about it all, isn't there? Just the idea of the specialness of the day and the season brings forth an expectation, an expectation of joy. I think, and you can think of days in your life that you anticipated. Remember that day that you were married? Maybe it was the 22nd. And guys, you did the countdown. Girls, you did the countdown. Maybe it was the day of graduation. Maybe it was your birthday. <clears throat> I won't mention names. Richard. or I believe Amanda, December 17. Things have an anticipation about them and a joy that comes. We start to mark time. And just the anticipation brings joy. Kids, you anticipated Friday as your last day of what? School for not one, not two, but how many weeks? Three weeks. Wow! You anticipated that for a long time, didn't you? You started to mark down those times. No school, vacation, graduations, weddings, birthdays, anniversaries. But we have something recorded in Scripture that surpasses all of that put together. It's the anticipation of expecting a baby that brings such great joy to us. All parents, when they start marking down the days to the due date, realize that the announcement has been made, the preparations, the details, and the baby is born. There they are wonderful in all of their innocence, in all of their need. The baby comes forth and the parent lovingly looks into their eyes and sees the future. The future. What will the future behold? In full anticipation, waiting so long that the birth might happen. How is your life? Is your life filled with great anticipation? Or is your life stuck in this season of what's it all about anyway? I got to go shopping and maybe I can clip a coupon. Let's see what I'll get in the sock this year, whether it'll be a lump of coal or something, uh, something that somebody's thankful for anticipating that which has been long waited for. Matthew records of that time in our scripture reading this morning. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For while he thought, um, then Joseph, her husband being a just man, not willing to make an example of her and put her away privately, 
But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived of her this day is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took upon Mary as his wife, and he knew her not until she brought forth the firstborn son, and He called his name Jesus. Let me suggest to you today, friends, it's time, it's time, it's time to put Christ back into Christmas, isn't it? We have too long been a quiet people, a PC people, who have extended that range of PC correctness to simply calling this the holiday season. Where is Christ in the holiday season? It's time that we we reinforce that Christ is in Christmas time. It's time to take back Christmas for Christ. You've, you've gone through the merchandising season. You've looked through the Neiman Marcus catalog. You've seen there, gentlemen, haven't you? the gift that your wife is anticipating. And if you have just the right American Express card, it will actually go through as you charge that $425,000 perfume that they are offering this year, custom made for your wife. Mine won't work. Not my MasterCard, which everything else is good for not my American Express, moving away from the retail side of this season, putting Christ first and foremost at this time of year. The Advent is about the arrival of Christ, faith, family, friends, the warmth, the love, the appreciation, and the joy that comes into this season. For his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from what? From their sins. He shall save their people from their sins, and he is God with us. That is the reason and the joy of this season. Romans says, Romans fourteen seventeen says, For this kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, Peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. We come into this season with a great anticipation. The anticipation that this season, just looking forward to celebrating the birth of Christ, in and of itself is reason for joy to start welling up in our hearts. That as we worship on Christmas Day, we worship Christ in joy. For he shall save his people from their sins, that their hearts might be filled with joy. But we realize that as a people, life isn't just linear. It's not just an incline of joy. But there is in this life times and seasons where joy is taken from us. Trauma events. You stand beside the bed of somebody who has been diagnosed with stage four cancer, and you wonder what the future holds. There will be an empty seat around the Christmas table this year for many families in our congregation. And on the other side of that, there's great joy as we dedicated a half a dozen children to the Lord during this Christmas season as well. But what do we say to those who've experienced the trauma and the loss during this season? How can we 
have a message of hope that will reach through and penetrate through that loss, that grief, that loneliness, that trial. The good news, friends, is Psalm 126. The good news is that regardless of what presses in on your life this year, that Christ is present there. For Psalm 126 says, When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again from our captivity, O Lord, as streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in, what does it say? They shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth bearing forth precious seed shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. How is it, how is it that sometimes we become stuck in the desert and we don't know where to go? You've been there at times in your life, haven't you, friends? You know that God loves you deeply. You know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem to bring you joy. But there's a world of distance between the desert and the joy, between the hopelessness and the joy, between the trouble and the trauma of life and the joy of the Bethlehem scene. How is it we make that journey from that which is parched to the wellspring of life. It's the Christmas message that regardless of what you're going through right now, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Lord has done great things for us and has allowed our hearts to be filled with joy and hope today, not because of something we have within us, but it's the Christmas story of the babe in the manger. And when I go back to that babe in the manger, I find it fascinating, because I find in that story something so simple that a child can understand it, as it's been told and retold down through the streams of time, but something so complex that the PhD in the world cannot fully comprehend it. Do you find yourself amazed at the Christmas story as Jesus coming, God's Son coming, that He might fill our hearts with His completeness and the joy that is only found in the Bethlehem Sea. It's an incredible story of anticipation, of joy that follows that anticipation, but that anticipation makes its full awareness and in its fullness in the gift of God's Son in the Bethlehem manger sea. It's an incredibly amazing story, isn't it? Isn't it time that we take and put Christ back into Christmas time? Isn't it time that we spend this time of year thinking daily about what Christ has done for us? For He shall save His people from their sins. And His name shall be called Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. What joy it gives. What joy it gives me to know that regardless of where I am in my spiritual experience, some days I'm very close to the Lord. And I hope you are also. But some days I'm not so close. I like to think I'm over here more than over here. But some weeks... I'm way over here, and I don't like it. And I just say, okay, you have to slog out another day, and it doesn't go very well. I'd like to think that all of my days would be joyful days, but it doesn't always work that way. So I'd like to 
I'd like to share with you and jot a couple of these ideas down for, for future use on a day that's not necessarily filled with joy. Sometimes, Carol Brenner has written some things that will maybe help focus our life to uh, understanding the art of joyful living. She simply says, bring silence and stillness into your life. You know, sometimes we get so busy that we don't have that time of silence and stillness where you just put yourself in the proverbial time out and you say, for the next five minutes, I'm just going to go to a place of quietude and just commune with God and say, God, what is it you want of me today? Help me to put Christ first and foremost. Another thing she mentions is don't be so busy with other people's affairs. She puts it, mind your own business. That's kind of right to the point, isn't it? Sometimes we clutter our minds in life with other people's cares and complexity of which we have absolutely no control. Who can control what goes on in the world? Just focus on what God wants you to do. She, she suggests that joy comes sometimes. Just give to others what you feel you are lacking the most. Huh, that seems to be kind of an oxymoron. How am I going to get more by giving it away? I've tried it. It works. It works. If you need people to be patient with you, be patient with them. If you need a smile, smile at them. If you think you'd, you'd like to have someone express joy to you, express joy to them. The fifth, the, the fifth, fourth thing is use your senses. Just take and absorb yourself where you find yourself in that space and time. Recognize what is working in your life, the good things that God is bringing into your life. Learn from life's experience. Be pleasant and move in the direction of joy. Move in the direction of joy because God's waiting there for you. If you're way over here and he's way over here, he'll come, he'll keep moving towards you. And just move towards him this Christmas time. Put Christ back into the Christmas season. And one of the things I believe that allows us to experience, when God, get, when God expressed, gave us the greatest expression of his love, he gave his only begotten son. Christmas is indeed about giving of ourselves one to another. It's not the size of the gift under the tree, it's the size of the gift of the heart, one to the another, filled with Christ's love. So let me share with you two illustrations that may bring some joy to you as you listen to them, and may bring some joy to you in this Christmas season. Through the joy of giving, that we experience the joy that God had as he gave his only begotten son. An author has written of her daughter's giving. Thusly, my 12-year-old daughter was sitting in the chair next to me in the family room. I said, Jessica, I found her sitting next to the Christmas tree very silent. Her long blonde hair nearly reaching the floor. Hey, what are you doing? I asked her. She didn't answer. I noticed her wiping her nose with the back of her hand. What's going on? I persisted. She paused. Have you spent everything you were going to spend on me for Christmas yet? I answered no. Why? How much is left? She looked at me in her eyes. I thought about the budget and wondered, where in the world is this coming from? She was probably going to ask me to get something way too expensive. I'm not sure, I answered. Around $90. 
and then I asked why. She turned to me and somewhat squeamishly with uh, tears streaking down her cheeks. Honey, I said, what's wrong? I sat down beside her and cradled her in my arms. This was my little baby, youngest of my children, Jessica, the one who took my husband's hand seven years ago as he passed at the tender age of five, she lost her daddy in a terrible flash fire at the place where he worked. After Saab, she told me what was on her mind. There are so many homeless people, Mom, this season of year. They don't have a home or a place to sleep. Can we give the rest of the money you're going to give and spend on presents for me to the homeless? Her request was put, it was sincere, and it caused tears in my eyes. Whatever you want, baby, that's what I'll do. The tiny bulbs on the tree sparkle. The family gathered to exchange gifts. The pile of presents under the tree were considerably smaller than previous years. As they were passed out, looking towards heaven with a, a grateful heart of gratitude, I silently said, thank you. That's all I could manage to say. Jessica smiled from the other side of the room as her sisters opened their packages, and as she gave me my present, I looked at her precious face and knew there was nothing in that box that could have been better than the gift she had already given me. The gift of joy of sharing with another. Taking the joy of Christ into our hearts and sharing that joy in a tangible way with others. One other quick Christmas story for the youngsters in our group. It's entitled The Magic of Giving. I don't care what other, uh, I don't care about the other dresses. I snipped at my mother who flashed me her warning. You've got plenty of dresses. Besides, it was your sister's jumper, and it barely fit her. I'm sure it would have been too, smug, too snug on you, she replied. Mother was right. It was too tight. But I figured I could get away wearing it just once. It was my favorite black velvet dress. She looked so good in it, my older sister did. Mom said, nope. Not this year. I've given it away. And you remember the family rules. Once something is given away, we never bring it up again. And we never tell who may be the recipient of it. Yes, but I wanted to wear it just once, was the reply. The evening of my Christmas program at school, I remained sullen as my parents dropped me off in the classroom. Of course, I couldn't help but envy all of the few girls clothed like princesses, parading around in their velvet dresses. Unfortunately, it put a damper on me because I didn't get to wear the dress that I wanted to wear that evening. As we shuffled into line, our chattering voices once again reached a deafening crescendo. The teacher attempted to quiet us, but to no avail. Moments later, the door opened, and sudden hush fell over the entire room as a beautiful girl entered the room that evening. Her long blonde hair swirled gorgeous curls that shimmered against the rich darkness of the black velvet dress. Her glow, on her, her glow on her face showed the ecstasy in her heart, and I checked twice to make sure it was her. Honestly, the transformation was stunning. Even dressed in black velvet, she looked like an angel straight from heaven. After a few moments, everyone finished gawking, and we proceeded down the hall into the auditorium. As we walked, my mind drifted back to the first week of school. She was a new student, Bust out to our school from overwhelmed city schools. However, 
the cruelest boy in class had confided in me that she would be the most beautiful girl in our grade if only she had a beautiful dress to put on. I noticed the whispers, the eyes rolling from a few girls. I left my place in line and walked over to her. You look absolutely stunning, beautiful, I said to her, and I meant every word of it. I love your velvet dress. It's gorgeous. Thank you, she meekly replied, obviously unaware of the history of that jumper. It's an early Christmas present. I never had anything so beautiful, she said, lovingly running her hands across the rich fabric, affectionately stroking it as if it were a fluffy kitten or dog. As I, uh, as I studied her glowing face, I mentioned that I had seen her smile a million times before, but never like this, a smile of an angel. As I watched my beautiful classmate, I was completely unprepared for the sincere, warm fuzziness of the emotions and joy that I felt in my heart. My mother's simple gift of giving had obviously transformed me, too. In truth, my mother had been right. Not only had my beautiful classmate needed the dress, more than I did, but there was a wonderful magic in giving. Let's put Christ back in the season and be filled with the joy of giving one to another more than just the gifts of the season, but the gifts that Christ gave to us. The gift of his being with us and we being with the one another, that Christ might fill this Christmas season.